Isaiah chapter 44. Certainly, the song we just sang about our great God fits, uh, beginning of verse 6, the king of Israel. There's no one, verse 8, there's no God besides me. No one. Beginning at verse 9. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their witnesses fail to see or know, so they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? <laughs> Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves, and let them stand up, and let them tremble, let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. In contrast to God, who back in chapter 40 we know doesn't become weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. And then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. But he also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, and over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, uh -huh, I'm warm, and I've seen the fire. But the rest of it, he makes into a god, his graven image. And he falls down before it, and he worships, and he prays to it, and he says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared over their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I've burned half of it in the fire and have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. And then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there a, not a lie in my right hand? Let's pray together. Lord, I, I would ask this morning in our time that we might learn. Um, Lord, continue to have your spirit teach us and work through in our hearts and lives this morning. Lord, you know the hearts of everyone here. You know the needs of everyone here. And Lord, I pray that in the things that have already taken place, both in the songs that we've sung, the words that have been shared and spoken, and uh, Lord, that, that the Spirit of God has already been speaking and encouraging and meeting those needs. And so, Father, continue to work, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I mentioned last week we'll draw this series to an end, and, and then in October, uh, We'll begin a new series that we have no idea how long it will last. Uh, we'll start an exposition of the Book of Romans. And, uh, and so I know some of you are already wondering, three years, five years. Uh, it won't be one year. Okay. Uh, but this... October, the end of October marks the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther uh, nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. And uh, often that is associated with the beginning of the Reformation. 
And certainly it was while he was preparing lectures in the book of Romans that he came across the truths in Romans chapter 1 that justification, the great truth of our standing before God, is not based on righteousness that is ours or trying to work for that righteousness, but the righteousness of God that's revealed in the gospel of Christ and that is received by faith. And so the great truth is that the just shall live by faith. And so we'll start looking and working our way through the book of Romans uh, at the end of October. This morning, in the way I wanted to finish this, there certainly were a number of other ways and topics. And I've chosen one about human dignity that is probably very difficult, and, and certainly I'm only touching on a part of it this morning. You say, well, this is all about idolatry, right? And well, well, what we read is all about idolatry. Uh, and, and really, it's about the foolishness of the folly of idolatry. I mean, think about it. You, you, the man cuts down a tree. He plants a tree. The tree grows. He cuts it down. He takes half the tree. And that tree, he makes a fire. He cooks his, his, his meal over it. He warms himself. And, but the other half, he, he, he takes that half a, a tree and fashions it into a, an image and worships it. I mean, that, that's nonsense, isn't it? That is nonsensical. It's irrational. But that's what he's describing. So why am I talking about idolatry? We were talking about the value of human life and dignity of being made in the image of God. Because ultimately, idolatry distorts the image of God. It distorts the image of God. And when you think about it, God has created and expressed that image already when he formed who? Us. God fashioned us. God's work is creating an image of himself. We represent what God is like. We express the character of God. We are created, made, fashioned in the image of God. And so idolatry distorts not only the image of the invisible God, idolatry ultimately distorts the image of humanity. Now, I, I, I realize that our image has been somewhat distorted because of the curse of sin. We don't represent what God is like. But remember, God had created man in his image and said, look, fill the earth so that, that people everywhere might know that I'm the Lord of the earth and that they might have a representation of who I am. And so idolatry really distorts the image of God. But I've come to this particular text because I find it interesting that the man takes that which is useful, that which is good, that which is useful, and makes it an idol. He takes wood, makes it an idol that tells us that it is possible for us as human beings to take those things that are useful and work and are good, can be good, and out of them make distortions of the image of God. I have one of these. You got one? When I take this out, it, it, it reminds me about how old I am. Because it makes me think about my life. And 
the development of technology in my lifespan. When, when you think about it, look, there is more, and so you may have heard this, there is more, if I use the term, computer power in this iPhone than there was to get Neil Armstrong to the moon. That this device has more computer potential, power potential, than the computers of NASA and putting in the Apollo program and putting Neil Armstrong on the moon. Now, I, I, I don't know if they would have rested it all on the technology of an iPhone, uh, because there were some other things that they had in place. But this is an incredible, uh, yeah, it's an iPhone, not an Android, I'm sorry. Um, this is an incredible piece of technology. And you think about it. Think about all the other technological devices and uses in our society. What your world is like and how different it is in your own lifetime. So, so technology can be a very good thing and useful thing. And yet at the very same time, technology can distort the dignity of humanity. Technology, when used for alternative means, can be an expression of idolatry. And so we want to be careful. We're not kind of throw away all technology. And, but I think if, even if you look at, at Isaiah 44, there's technology there. He fashions a tool. He does different things. He uses technology. But he uses technology ultimately to create a God, an image. And so just as a, some thoughts for us to think about in a technological age, and certainly technology is not going to stop the advances of technology. I said they're, they're tremendous benefit. In the first hour, uh, Lauren Lamaster was here. Uh, many of you know Lauren. Uh, Lauren had a little boy named Jay who was not quite a year old, but Jay was born without hearing, the ability to hear. And about two weeks ago, they put cochlear implants into Jay's ears. And a week ago, they turned him on, and for the very first time, he heard his mother and his father's voice. That's technology. Isn't that wonderful? That's great. Okay, so it has tremendous upside. And yet there are dangers. One of the things that is true of man and created in the image of God is that we are relational beings who communicate. Relational beings who communicate. There's been a number of articles that have debated this very, this topic with regards to millennials. So those under age 13, 20, and 35, I'll just lump that together. Do you know what the topic is? Is technology dehumanizing? And the one area that they are wrestling with is in the area of personal relationships and communication. I use mine to text. Uh, uh, I use mine, I don't use this thing for nearly enough what it's powered for. Uh, I'm technologically challenged. Here at church, they don't give me keys or passwords to anything with technology. Okay? But I know how to text. My kids laugh at me how I text. It's not with my thumbs, it's my fingers. 
But you know where I'm going, don't you, with your kids? They could be sitting at the table over dinner. And what are they doing? They're texting. Who are they texting? You say, well, they're friends. No, they may be texting somebody else at the table. <laughs> right across the table from Okay. And this is this expression of dehumanization that the millennials are wrestling with, is that they're losing the ability to communicate face to face. It's more than just texts, words. There's an incarnational aspect to communication. When you come to this particular text in Isaiah 44, certainly in other texts of the scriptures as well, the one thing about idols that are fashioned and carved and out of stone or wood, that the Bible says they didn't either hear nor speak. These things don't communicate. They lack the ability. There's nothing incarnational, relational about them at all. And when I think about the image of God in the area of communication and relationship, I, I think of two texts. One is in Exodus chapter 33. There's a wonderful text about Moses, and there's a whole storyline going into chapter 34, which is so important in the storyline of Scripture. But in Exodus 33, Moses, in, in writing this, this account, says that, he would go into the tent of meeting. It wasn't the tabernacle, but there was a tent of meeting. And he would go there to talk with God, meet with God. But the way in which Moses writes this, the way it's recorded in the book of Exodus is this. And Moses would meet with God face to face, talk with God face to face as a man does his friend. That God communicates, and man communicates face to face. That incarnational, that personal relationship of communication. The, the other text is John 1.1, 1, 1, which is so familiar, but John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It, it's that middle clause, that middle one that we want to look at, and when it says the word was with God, that John doesn't use the preposition with. He, he doesn't use that particular preposition. We use the word with in English, but literally it's an expression, prostantheon. Before. The idea of Before. And some have translated it in understanding it this way. And the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was face to face with God. And the Word was God. That Jesus, the Son of God, was in a relationship of communication there with the Father. And God has created man he has created us in his image to be able to face-to-face -face communicate in very intimate, personal, relational terms. Technology can be used to, to help in some ways. I love FaceTime. I love Skype. I love to be able to communicate and see somebody. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. Now I can see somebody, not only in another part of this country, but around the world, and carry on a conversation. There's benefit, but at the same point in time, it doesn't replace. And sometimes we do narrow it down in our communication to that which is a distortion of what it means to be in the image of God. The other thing that's interesting is that this, he creates and then he falls down before it and he worships it. 
you know, worship is not just singing songs. In fact, the idea that's included in the idea of worship is we, we actually said it, sang it in one of the songs we sang. We said, we bow down. To worship is to acknowledge the worth of the individual and their authority and to place ourselves under them. If you'll allow me, we place ourselves at their disposal to serve them. So our worship includes our saying to God, you alone are worthy, we are here to be used as you see fit. We are your servants. Isn't that like technology a little bit in this, this sense? How it distorts that relationship is that sometimes we become servants or slaves of our own technology. We create it. We make it. They're supposedly to serve us, but we end up being a slave to it. It drives our life. It dictates our life. Elon Musk, the great contemporary theologian. <laughs> you know, Tesla and SpaceX. has some great concerns about the advance of technology. You know what one of his great concerns is? He, he actually says that humans must become cyborgs and establish some kind of direct connection with the machines if they want to avoid, that is humans, want to avoid becoming obsolete because part of that is they will eventually become the masters and humans will be the slaves kind of sounds like Terminator, right? Rise of the machines or something. But that's what he's saying. And certainly some dystopia form and, and, and end of world, that's not what we're talking about. But in very practical terms, how often do we let and how easily we let our technology, those things that should be useful to us, dictate our life? and we become subject to them. We end up worshiping them. Not in the way that you might think, but in bowing down to them. The, the other is the man takes this image this piece of wood, and he fashions it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it sits in a house. It sits in a house. Attached to this idea is that sometimes we create and use technology to diminish our work. Now, that may sound a little strange, but what it does is to make our life easier, right? So it gives us more time, supposedly, right? So that we don't have to work as hard, or eventually we don't have to work at all. Work is a part of being in the image of God. The dignity of work is a dignity of man. Because God works. He didn't come to the end of the six days and say, okay, I'm done. God continues to work. And he gave Adam, he gave man work to do prior to the fall. Work is good as an expression of the image of God. Now technology should be help us in our work. 
but it doesn't replace our work in order to create more leisure. For in doing so, it's stripping away that dignity of what it means to be in the image of God. And when our technology, when that prow prowess creates in us a world without God, much like Babel, which is technological, it's creation of a tower. It takes technology to do that. In order to say we don't need God, that we can bring about and fulfill ultimate purpose and destiny, that we can fulfill satisfaction in a human life, that really is a detachment from reality and ends up being a fantasy world. We are created in his image to relate to him, to work his purpose, to realize that satisfaction and fulfillment in life is not realized through technology. It will not bring utopia. And it will never satisfy the human heart. You, you want to know how that's true? You want to see an expression of that? This week, September 12th. What is September 12th? Anybody know? Anybody know what, what the significance of September 12th is? Danny O'Connell's birthday? Hey, we'll have a party. <laughs> Anybody know what September 12th is? The day after 9-11? astute young man. <laughs> Tim Cook has a conference on the 12th of September. You know what it is? To unveil iPhone 8. <laughs> In case you didn't know that. And about a week later, they'll be available in stores. Go down to Kenwood in a week's time and look at the line out the door of the Apple store in order to buy an iPhone 8. Even though they may have an iPhone 7. <laughs> because they think that the latest advances, the newest advances will bring something to them. And it doesn't. Now again, nothing wrong with having an iPhone 8 next when it comes out. But if you think that the latest technology will bring you satisfaction. You're mistaken. It strips away your dignity as a human being. Because that satisfaction only comes when you realize that your satisfaction comes from the one who created you in his image. And your value and your worth and your significance is not attached to the latest technology is attached to your relationship to him. Technology may offer escapes, may offer promises, but it'll offer escapes and promises that ultimately it cannot deliver. And that's what an idol does. Only God can. And to demonstrate that, he sent someone who is in his image perfectly the image of the invisible God, his name was Jesus, in order to redeem us, in order to show us, in order to reconcile and bring us back into that right relationship so that we might be conformed to the image of God in the way God has designed us. And so when I look at Isaiah 44, I can laugh at the nonsensical and irrationality of an idol worshiper, but I realize that I just live in a more technologically advanced, idolatrous world that strips away at the human dignity, even as they did 4,000 years ago. Over the course of the summer, hopefully, what we've looked at is to say everyone sitting in this room has value. Everyone has worth. Everyone 
has dignity. And by the way, those who are not in this room, who are down the hallway in the special needs class, they have value and they have dignity and they have worth. And the, ones, the, little, the little ones all the way around, same way. Those who are orphans have dignity and have value. Those who have no technology have dignity and they have value. Julie, the ones you're going to have dignity and value because they're created in the image of God and Christ, the exact representation of God, came and died for them. And I hope you understand and that you are looking forward to that glorification, that restoration of all things where you will fully understand and fully know. And I say fully, but you'll see him as he is. And you'll see who you really are, too.